Hey guys, it's Lady and welcome back to the series of videos where I break down everything about our favorite Genshin characters. From stories unlocked via raising companionship levels, to voice lines said by other characters, to appearances in event quests, and so on. In other words, whether you don't have a specific character, can't be bothered to raise their companionship levels, need a refresher, or just want the basic TLDR of a character's text, then this ultimate lore guide is for you. Now, thanks to his rerun in patch 2.8, and the fact that I really relate to his approach to life and his love of nature, this video will focus on our favorite wandering samurai, Kaedehara Kazuha. So let's begin by going over the info from his character stories that are unlocked via companionship leveling. I just think this serves as important background context for Kazuha's actions during the events of the game, which we'll cover later. But with that said, how did an Inazuman samurai find himself among the Crux fleet's ranks? Well, first we'll have to rewind quite a bit, starting with the history of the Kaedehara family. This clan was once one of the most illustrious in all of Inazuma City. But due to a peculiar incident that occurred generations ago, they soon fell on hard times. The family fortune crumbling by the time it was Kazuha's to inherit. For brevity's sake, the Kaedehara clan lost the means to their family trade, resulting in a family of bladesmiths that could no longer produce even a single strong sword. I'll go over the story of the Raiden Gokaden and what happened to Kazuha's great-grandfather in more detail in the event section of this video. Or if you want to learn more now, you can just go to this timestamp shown on screen. But anywho, back to Kazuha. As a young lad, he felt utterly helpless at his inability to do anything but watch as his family's future collapsed. And yet, he also couldn't shake this feeling of relief when the last attendant was dismissed and his ancestral home was officially repossessed. You see, Kazuha has had a deep appreciation for the beauty of nature since his youth and has always longed to roam the forests and mountains. Since he no longer held any responsibilities to the Kaedehara lineage, he was now free to strike out on his own and wander to his heart's content. So thus began his journey as a wandering samurai, his keen sense of the natural world proving invaluable on his travels, since it allowed him to predict the weather and other particular events beforehand. For example, once during early summer, during a period of frequent rainfall, Kazuha's intuition saved him from a Bakedanuki's prank. At that time, he was traveling with a merchant and night was beginning to fall, meaning it would be in their best interest to find a place to hunker down. No sooner had he thought this, that a small straw hut came into view. The merchant wished to stay here for the night, but Kazuha, having listened intently to the world around him, suggested they find someplace else. In the end, the merchant decided to rest in this hut while Kazuha moved on to other lodgings. Now when morning came, the former found himself waking up on a pile of mud and directly beneath the bright daylight. Awaiting nearby, a bemused Kazuha explained that this prank must have been the work of a Bakedanuki. You see, thanks to the sound of the wind, Kazuha came to realize this wasn't a real straw hut, its walls sounding anything but solid. Overall, though, Kazuha made many friends along his travels, becoming especially close to one. The two journeyed together for a time, though soon found themselves having to part ways. Not out of any animosity, mind you, but simply because their destinations were different. Now, Kazuha thought nothing of it at the time, believing they were fated to meet again at some point. However, not long after did the Raiden Shogun announce the Vision Hunt Decree. This led to a great panic among all Vision Bearers, resulting in many concealing their identities and going into hiding, Kazuha included. But one day, 
he received news that his friend, also a fellow vision wielder, had done the unthinkable and called for a duel before the throne. The defeated party would face the ultimate punishment by the very hand of the almighty shogun, but Kazuha's friend was prepared to risk it all, partly for the opportunity to face such a strong foe and partly to demonstrate to others the true meaning of courage. This news gripped the normally calm Kazuha in fear, resulting in his brash storming of Tenchukaku. But he was too late to do anything for his friend. Arriving to nothing but his shattered sword and the empty husk of his vision. In his last moments, what expression was on his face? Before I knew it, I had stepped forward and snatched the dying vision and was running from the scene. All I knew was that I mustn't let his hope, which burned so brightly, become buried among the ice-cold statue of a god. And so, Kazuha fled with grief in his heart and a newfound status as a wanted man. Thus ended his peaceful days as a wanderer, a series of unending battle and conflict rising to replace them. Though Kazuha had the good fortune of befriending Captain Beto of the Crux Fleet, and it was the port of Rito where she officially introduced him to the crew as their latest addition, the Crux crew came to admire their newcomer's martial prowess and ability to predict the weather. So even though trouble still found him from time to time, nothing was insurmountable for Kazuha with the support of his new mates. Now, in regards to these events, you may have noticed that there's some interesting differences, let's say, in the written lore and what is depicted in later patch-specific events. It's honestly nothing major or bad, but it is related to a wider topic that I'd like to address later in the video. But speaking of all this strife in Inazuma regarding visions, you may be asking, how did Kazuha himself come to acquire his own? Well, it was on one stormy night in the hospitality of a stranger's home that he was finally given a true opportunity to reflect on his journey so far. It wasn't always easy as a wanderer, having to move from island to island on the Inazuma archipelago. In fact, his travels out on the open sea, oftentimes alone, mind you, were quite perilous in the midst of strong headwinds and thunderstorms. And yet, he still held a limitless fascination for the vast sky and boundless earth that could only be experienced on this wandering journey of his. So with sword in hand and chosen path in his heart, Kazuha slept soundly that night, having made peace with it all. Then the next morning, he awoke to a shining vision lying upon his chest. But now with Kazuha's background covered, I think it's a good time to transition to his appearances in the actual game, starting with the prologue to Inazuma's Archon Quest. We're first introduced to him via Beto in the hopes that she'd be willing to take us to Inazuma. This request is quite intriguing to both of them, since they assume Traveler was here to enter the Clash, a martial arts competition in which Kazuha is supplying the top reward this year. A masterless vision that will be the champions to keep if they're able to reawaken it. The Traveler's sheer skill in the qualifying match, without using any elemental abilities at that, has Beto automatically sending us through to the semi-finals. Now, Kazuha, being a skilled warrior himself, assures us not to worry ourselves over any special treatment, since at our level, we would have made it through to the semi-finals anyway. Then, after our victory in said match, Kazuha takes us aside and reveals that he's actually aware of our ability to wield multiple elements even without a vision. He'd very much like to observe us channeling this in combat, given his intense curiosity of this subject. In fact, he desires to know what meaning visions have to the gods, and what drives them to grant them in the first place. Anyway, as thanks for our demonstration, 
he agrees to answer any questions we currently have of Inazuma. So, as we've already heard from Zhong Li, there's a vision hunt decree currently in effect. And by the way, we the players may be aware that, in hindsight, the Archons are not the ones who grant visions, but for all Kazuha knows, perhaps the Electro Archon is doubting the very act of bestowing visions itself. Furthermore, in light of the Shogun's pursuit of eternity, Kazuha can't help but look at Liyue's contracts and how they're for the benefit of all the nation's citizens. While on the other hand, what good does the Shogun's eternity bring for the people? What with the vision hunt and isolationist Sakoku policies put in place? In other words, the people in Inazuma have not been faring well these days. But we must cut the interesting conversation short when it comes time for the final match of the clash to get underway. However, when our final opponent begins to look like a no-show, Kazuha suggests we check on the prize. And what do you know, it's gone alright. This doesn't phase the wandering samurai one bit though. He knows nothing can escape nature's watchful gaze and helps us read the wind current so we can easily catch up with the culprit. It's revealed that Kazuha heard the exact moment the prize was stolen all along, but there's a reason why he didn't stop the thief then and there. Once we catch up with the treasure hoarder, let's just say the cruel threats Kazuha makes are among the things we were least expecting. Who would have thought this gentle wanderer would even consider breaking the culprit's arms as punishment? Or worse, branding Thief on his forehead for standing up the competition and tarnishing the reputation of Captain Beidou. In lieu of these threats, the treasure hoarder risks fighting us to get away. But even in this true moment of desperation, the masterless vision fails to awaken for him. It turns out Kazuha was just bluffing, all in an attempt to rekindle the empty husk. A person's greatest strength appears only when they're backed into a corner after all. Then we're made privy as to why he's so obsessive over this object and the topic of visions, cue Kazuha's recollection of his friend's desire to face the Shogun's most powerful strike, the Muso no Hitotachi. To wrap up the prologue, he assures us that Beidou keeps her promises, meaning our tournament prize is just as we requested safe passage to Inazuma. Kazuha plays no further role in the story until the end of Act 2. He shows up just in time to help General Goro's forces as part of the mercenary reinforcements Kokomi secured for the resistance. It's actually thanks to Kazuha and Beidou that the Divine Priestess is already familiar with our feats prior to the start of Act 3. Then in the culminating battle of Inazuma's Archon Quest, Kazuha is among the resistance forces that storm Tenshukaku only moments after we conclude our duel with Senora. In the aftermath, it looked like the Shogun was letting us go free. Though apparently not really, since she moves to strike us from behind. But at long last, the thing Kazuha has tirelessly searched for all this time ends up now occurring by his very own hand. His friend's vision bursts to life for the briefest of moments, giving Kazuha the strength to parry the Muso no Hitotachi, a feat no one believed was possible. The Traveler and Yaimiko then handle the rest. Finally, during the epilogue, we see Kazuha paying respects to his friend's grave. Having fulfilled his true vision at last, Kazuha leaves the husk at the foot of his final resting place. Now, this is where I change up the usual structure of my lore videos, in that, instead of going straight into Kazuha's story quest, I'll be covering Patch 2.6 Irodori Festival first, since the story it covers provides some necessary context. So, during the event, the tale of these ancient Inazuma poets, known as the Five Kasen, was used to symbolically tell of the decline of the Raiden Gokaden which once referred to Inazuma's five foremost schools of swordsmithing, all of which fell under the Yashiro Commission. The Kaedehara clan was the practitioner of one such school, the Ishin art, up until Kazuha's great-grandfather's generation. 
Now, during the actual festival, Kazuha and Ayaka were both selected as symbolic stand-ins for one of the five Kasen poets, those being Akahito and Sumizome, respectively. Long story short, Akahito was framed before the Raiden Shogun by a fellow member, Kuronushi, and was exiled as a result. Sumizome was the one who discovered the truth behind this deceit, that Akahito's poem was never plagiarized at all, but instead was tampered with by Kuronushi. Like Sumizome in the Five Kasen, the Kamisato siblings play an important role in helping Kazuha uncover the truth behind his family's fall from grace. At the Kamisato estate, Ayaka produces the sword-forging diagram that once belonged to the Kaedeharas, close inspection proving that it had indeed been tampered with. So the decline of the Ishin art wasn't due to a lack of skilled smiths, but an altered diagram. This finding spurs Kazuha to investigate what's left of his family's belongings, which have since been seized by the Tenryo Commission ever since Kazuha became a wanted criminal under the Vision Hunt Decree. Obviously, that's all in the past now, but when speaking with Kujo Sara, Kazuha makes it clear that he isn't seeking to reclaim any of these items. He simply just wants to investigate them. So he asks Sara to sell them in his stead and use the funds to help the poor. In the police warehouse, Kazuha uncovers his great-grandfather's old bonsai tree, and an old yellowed note hidden inside a secret compartment. Long story short, the letter contains the truth of what happened all those years ago. Kunikuzushi, aka Scaramouche, sought revenge on a certain blacksmith in particular, by destroying the entire Raiden Gokuden in general. He was a real culprit behind the tampered diagrams. Then one night, when Kazuha and Ayaka's great-grandfathers began pursuing him, to their shock, they found themselves easily defeated by a lone Kunikuzushi. Having sustained terrible wounds, they could have easily died by his hand. Yet, surprisingly, this mysterious stranger ended up sparing their lives once he realized Kaedehara Yoshinori was a descendant of the Niwa family. Nevertheless, Yoshinori gave up the Ishin art and kept the truth of what transpired secret out of fear that this dangerous culprit could strike again. Ultimately, Kazuha takes his great-grandfather's penned words to heart, to not blindly chase revenge, nor dwell on that which occurred in the past. Therefore, Kazuha's takeaway from these revelations is that the truth is enough for him. He'll continue to focus his life on the present. Though if it does so happen that the same enemy is plotting more trouble in the future, well, he won't be turning a blind eye to that. Moving on to Kazuha's story quest just released this patch, we first find him at the Kujo estate, where Kujo Kamaji offers, on behalf of the entire shogunate, to restore the Kaedehara clan status. The findings of their investigation show that it was the workings of the Fatui, and not the Raiden Gokuden, that brought shame to Her Excellency all those years ago. Now, before Kazuha can fully take in this proposal, we also lay on the news that some dangerous man is searching for him. In fact, this samurai mistook us for him earlier and even attacked us with this ominous glowing sword. So, Kazuha makes Kujo Kamaji a deal. He'll return with his answer after this more pressing case about the samurai is resolved. It turns out there was a weapons collector, a Mr. Nagato, who finally decided to sell some of his treasures in order to pay off his family's debts. Of such weapons was the glowing sword, the buyer being one Amenoma Yuya. It turns out Yuya mortally wounded Mr. Nagato, took the blade for himself, and has been looking for Kazuha ever since. We eventually track him down by following the mysterious Tatarigami energy coming from Nagato's warehouse. But it's not actually Yuya we end up speaking to, but the very blade itself, currently in possession of Amanoma's body. 
The blade's master was once a famed practitioner of the Ishin art, but couldn't live up to the shogun's expectations. So he fled the nation to Snezhnaya, where he continued his tireless work until at last he successfully forged this mighty blade, and even endowed it with a consciousness of its own. After its master's death, the blade was determined to make it back to Inazuma by any means necessary and face the full force of the shogun, all to prove the might of the Ishin art. It's no matter to the blade that this journey has cost many lives, given how it would simply move on to the next body once the current host was injured or became too weary to continue on. The blade has heard that Kazuha is a descendant of Kaidehara, and therefore the Ishin art. And better yet, he's faced the Muso no Hitotachi once already, so there can be no other host as ideal as him, but Kazuha has heard quite enough. He cannot stand the blade's utter cruelty, and can tell that, underneath all this incredible determination, is a profound despair that it'll likely never achieve this lofty goal. But the blade refuses to let it end now after coming so far, and threatens to possess Yuya until his inevitable end if we continue to stand in its way. So Kazuha makes it a bet. He'll allow the blade to make him his host briefly, so as to prove if its self-proclaimed might actually holds water. Since Kazuha has no similar obsessions like Yuya's or Nagato's, he should be able to resist the Tatarigami's influence for a while. The Takasukasa clan's now abandoned base is completely overrun with swaths of Ronin, making it a perfect testing ground. And just as Kazuha expected, the blade proves difficult to use after going so long without any proper maintenance. So it's not long until the blade's strength fades, its glowing disguise eventually fading to reveal the true battered form underneath. It also wasn't able to resonate with Kazuha's consciousness in the end, despite its attempt to do so instead of straight up possessing him. At the same time, Kazuha was able to peek into the blade's memories and discover the truth behind the Ishin practitioner's intentions. He never meant to forge the blade out of frustration at the Shogun, but as a way to atone for his desertion to the Kaedehara clan, knowing he dealt a huge blow to their reputation in doing so. The blacksmith's feelings were unfortunately warped by the Tatarigami though, which has led to the cursed blade we see today. In the end, the blade expresses true remorse for the terrible things it's done, and frees Aminoma Yuya. Then sensing how it no longer holds any ill will, Kazuha grants the blade's final request and allows himself to be completely controlled by it. It's here and now that the blade channels all of its remaining strength into the forging of a brand new form, at the cost of its own consciousness. Before it completely fades away for good, it entrusts its true name to Kazuha, Kagotsurube Ishin. With that, Kazuha doubles down on his promise to the blade to continue studying and practicing the Ishin art. Though in his own way, of course, meaning he doesn't need the shogunate's resources to do so. So yeah, he ultimately turns down Kujo Kamaji's offer, choosing to continue down his own path instead. Now aside from Patch 2.6's main event, Kazuha has shown up in a couple others as well, starting with a minor one in 2.2. The lore of the rhythm minigame from this patch is that Kazuha unearthed an ancient zither in one of Liyue's caves, one that must have belonged to an adeptus its incredible ability resulting in the perfect musical accompaniment when played. Since he's had his fill of it, he passes the instrument to us as a gift. Now during our exchange, Paimon ends up mentioning the tone-deaf bard, an individual who Kazuha hopes to meet someday, and lo and behold, he gets to do just that in version 2.8's main event, Summertime Odyssey. Fellow musicians Kazuha and Shinyan had set out on a trip together, eventually winding up in Mondstadt. We catch them at Angel Share with Venti, 
who puts on a lively retelling of last summer's island adventures with Klee and friends. We extend an invitation to the islands without consulting Fischl or Mona first, though that turns out to be of no consequence since the easygoing Shinyan and Kazuha catch on to the princess's antics in no time. Then, once we arrive at our destination, we accompany Kazuha on an initial scouting mission. Long story short, a Fatui researcher's machine is currently being tested here, but has broken down giving rise to these mirage structures that reflect the innermost beings of each of our four friends respectively. Kazuha's provides more insight into many of his old childhood memories, one in particular showing his younger self's worry that he's a disappointment to his father, considering how the latter was already helping with the family trade when he was Kazuha's age at the time. But his father simply didn't want to burden his son with the all but assured demise of their clan's craft, and offers Kazuha some words of wisdom, that like an animal caught in a trap, sometimes it's better to sacrifice the leg than be stuck there forever. Or in other words, leaving the family business behind for new horizons. The final section of Kazuha's mirage details the events of his escape from Tenchukaku, and Inazuma as a whole. Here we get some confirmation of the lore introduced via Ayato's voice lines, that the Yashiro Commission did indeed help Kazuha flee by a boat from Narukami Island to Rito. And then from there, the crewmates from the Alcor called out to him, clearly able to see how he was being chased and could use a ride out of Inazuma. Having had this chance to reflect on everything that's happened in his life so far, even though the hymn of today feels unladen by it all, perhaps this empty bonsai pot responsible for controlling his mirage was still trying to tell him something all along. It looks like deep down, Kazuha's had this desire to keep the Kaedehara traditions alive in some way, considering how his father, his father's father, and so forth, all kept and tended to their own bonsai creations. Then later in the event, he plays a heartwarming role alongside Shinyan and Mona in supporting Fischl when she faces her true self, <coughs> I mean, the princessin, who has taken over her kingdom. Just seeing how her friends, both new and old, accept her for who she is, she is able to accept her identity as both Fischl and the Princessin, and integrate them together. Once everyone's mirage is taken care of, it's up to our entire group to fix the Fatui's machine before the dream-inducing effect can get any worse. Then with everything settled at last, Kazuha and the rest can truly kick back and enjoy the rest of their island vacation. So now we've arrived at Kazuha's thoughts on other characters and vice versa. So let's start off with Captain Beto, the one he owes his life to. Cause not only did the Crux crew shelter him while he was a wanted man, but Beto gave him the courage to return to Inazuma during this most difficult time in his life. Beto herself is beyond proud to know he blocked THE Muso no Hitotachi. It's nice that he's decided to sail with them for a while longer, but regardless of when he moves on to the next leg in his journey, she'll be sure to send him off with a drink. Speaking of close friends, Kazuha and Goro managed to become such even though their time together in the Resistance was brief. Kazuha appreciates that Goro speaks his mind freely, and is really there for his men, sharing both the highs and lows with them. He was just truly someone Kazuha got along with. Meanwhile, Goro learned how to be more carefree and live life with fewer constraints from Kazuha's example. He really is a different breed from all those other wandering samurai, seeing how he always managed to contribute something to those around him, even if he never stayed in one place for long. As for the leader of the resistance, Hokomi is grateful to Kazuha for following every one of her commands to a T, despite his naturally freer spirit. Meanwhile, Kazuha definitely appreciated her doing her best to keep casualties to a minimum, though he also couldn't help but notice her tendency to take way too much upon herself. 
But with his allies covered, what does Kazuha think about his enemies? At least in regards to Inazuma's main story. Well, regarding Kujo Sara, even though he can recognize her power, seeing how she defeated his friend in the duel before the throne, he simply can't forgive her for choosing to remain an oppressor's lackey, relentlessly confiscating people's visions and all. However, his thoughts have somewhat changed after she confronted her own clan in Act 3 over their dealings with the Fatui. So, perhaps she does fight for her own ideals after all. As for the Shogun, he once questioned if his resentment was simply due to her striking down his friend. But after further reflection, Kazuha has come to accept that his friend knew what he was getting into. So no, Kazuha's true distaste of the Shogun wasn't so much about his friend as it was about the entire vision hunt and how perfectly fine she was with robbing people of their hopes and dreams. But though Kazuha had much to resent the Shogunate for, he somehow got along swimmingly with Shikanoin Hazel. The detective is definitely not someone to underestimate. His happy-go-lucky disposition may fool others, but once he's on the case, that same energy turns into a razor-sharp focus that's quite remarkable to witness. Hazel himself was thoroughly impressed with Kazuha's ability to read his natural surroundings. It's honestly thanks to him that some valuable clues came to light. So it's such an utter shame he has no official grounds to arrest him, or aka bring him in for help, anymore. Guess he'll just have to make do with the normal friend thing, like, you know, just simply inviting him to discuss cases now. But moving on to other light-hearted characters, Kazuha unloaded Yoimiya's last firework shipment to Liyue himself, and boy were they heavy. Only someone like her could make something like that. Meanwhile, Yoimiya's of the impression that only those with many cares speak of ancient poetry and scenery. So seeing how Kazuha talks a lot in natural metaphors, he must have quite the story to tell. As for the one and only Arataki Ito, he has heard the sick news through the grapevine that a certain wandering samurai blocked the Muso no Hitotachi. And seeing how he's from a fallen clan, and Ito's also from a fallen clan, well, it's only natural for it to be his turn to block whoever tries to attack the Traveler next. Oh please, Ito, never change. And hailing all the way from Liyue, everyone's favorite opera singer Yunjin loves audience members like Kazuha. Because whether it's an orchestral section or a percussive piece, he always just sits and listens with quiet appreciation. Now lastly, Kamisato Ayato claims that even though his forebears have failed to prevent the Kaidehara's decline, he still has a duty to support Kazuha as the Yashiro commissioner. He may be unable to restore his clan's former fortunes, but at the very least he can help him avoid arrest by the Tenryo commission. But now that we're on this topic, remember what we went over earlier in Kazuha's character stories section? Well, Ayato's voice line and the Summertime Odyssey event have clearly recontextualized some aspects of it. Namely, how quickly he joined the crux after the events of Tenshukaku, and the help he received from the Yashiro Commission. It honestly doesn't surprise me how they added the Elder Kamisato into Inazuma's plot, but it does play into the larger topic of live service games being more susceptible to these retcons no matter how big or small they are, than games that have a single set release. Now I am of the mind that it's plausible that Inazuma, being Genshin's first major expansion and all, had some bumps in the development process of its plot. I talk more about that theory in the video and the cards if you're curious, but what do you guys think about this topic overall? I'd love to hear in the comments! But on a final note, I just want to talk about the etymology of Kazuha's full name and how it relates to his love of nature and attitude towards life in general. So his surname Kaedehara translates to Maple Grove, 
and his first name essentially translates to a myriad of leaves, meaning his elemental burst totally checks out, and is also still my favorite aesthetically even after viewing it thousands of times at this point. Also, prior to my chronic neurological condition and mobility issues, I used to do group wilderness backpacking and trekking. So, Kazuha's experiences with nature invoke a lot of nostalgia for me. The sound of the rain, for example, and how he has a complicated relationship with it, since he used to love it when he was younger, but now as a wanderer, it takes on a much different meaning, seeing how it now means he has to worry about finding shelter for the night. This really hit home for me because there's definitely been days where I've gotten soaked even with rain gear out on the trail. One time we even went up and over a mountain with our full packs on while it was downpouring, all because we had to stay on itinerary. So yes, Kazuha, I get that listening to the rain in drenched clothes is hardly peaceful indeed. And yet, I can't help but hold a fondness for overcast and rainy days, since they were, and still are, incredibly rare in my native California. I also like how Kazuha reframes his experiences. His thoughts regarding his friend's vision shell, for example. He mentions how, without it in the first place, he never would have met Captain Beto or the fabled traveler. And, in general, he just likens life to the rise and fall of a mountain path, and overall how there are always seasons of hopelessness and desperation, but also those of great serendipity. I view events in my own life similarly, one of such being my transverse myelitis diagnosis. Without it, I wouldn't have reconnected with video games, started my YouTube channels, or met so many awesome people online. Not to mention everything I've learned regarding ableism, accessibility issues, and the communities affected by it via experiencing it firsthand myself. Not everything is good, of course, since there are also immense difficulties and sorrows that come with living in this situation. But I think Kazuha's view of maple leaves is a very apt summation of this kind of feeling slash mentality. You see, he loves maple leaves, and yet they're also bittersweet since so many goodbyes seem to have happened when they've turned red. Well, overall, while Kazuha's outward personality may be much more zen than my own, I can't help but hold a deep fondness for his introspective nature and overall approach to life. But otherwise, that's it! Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this series of lore videos. Any updates I do for Kazuha in the future will be linked in the pinned comment below. Also, we'd love to have you join our very welcoming and active Discord community at discord.gg slash ladyvirgilia, and follow me on Twitter and on Twitch if you wish. Thanks for watching guys and take care.